Hi, I'm Henry and I'm a tutor at the Jacked Greek Summer School. And in this video, I'll be giving you a brief introduction to two important cases in Greek, the genitive and the dative. First of all, a recap about what we mean by the word cases. Well, a case can be thought of as the form or spelling of the noun, and this shows the noun's role within the sentence whether it's, for example, doing the action or having the action done to it. Cases are really, really important to be aware of in Greek when we're dealing with nouns and indeed adjectives. Um, we don't think of them too much in English because we really rely on word order to show what's happening to each noun in the sentence. You've met so far the nominative. That's used for the subject when the noun is doing the verb. And you've also met the accusative. That's used for the object when the noun is on the receiving end of the verb. Have a look at this example sentence and see if you can work out which is nominative and which is accusative. The translation, Hertheia acue tus logus, the goddess hears the words. So here in red, Hertheia is our nominative, the goddess, because she's doing the listening or the hearing. In green, tus logus are accusative because they're on the receiving end, they're being heard. Now we're going to meet the genitive and the dative, the third and fourth of the four major cases in Greek. The vocative is a fifth one, but that's not nearly quite so important because it's often the same in, in terms of its form as the nominative, and vocatives when you're talking to somebody in the sentence are not so frequent as the other four cases. So there are four main cases in Greek, and the genitive and the dative are the third and the fourth. Let's just talk about their roles briefly. So the genitive is used to show possession. And in English, of course, we use the word of, the book of the teacher, or we can use an apostrophe either before or after the S, the teacher's book, which probably sounds a bit more natural. An example here, the goddess hears the words of the sailor, and the sailor is the genitive there, or the goddess hears the sailor's words. It's important to note that it's the owner or the possessor who goes into the genitive. So here it's the sailor that's in the genitive, not the words. The words happen here to be accusative, but actually they could be any case at all. It could be something like the words of the sailor are excellent in which case the words would be nominative. But the owner, the sailor, would still have to be genitive because that's who owns or possessive possesses the words. The dative, finally, is what we call the indirect object. Now that's not a very clear uh, description in many ways. Um, it's, it's quite hard to define. I would say that it's a noun which is affected by the action going on in the sentence, but it's not the direct object of the verb. Now in English, we usually use the words either to or for to translate the dative. And here's a nice example. I give the book to my friend. Now, I am the nominative, the subject. The direct object, the accusative, is the book. I give the book because the book is being given. The friend is affected in the action and is involved in the sentence but it's not the direct object of the verb, which is the book. So I give the book to my friend. So with the dative, have in your head the words two or four as your starting point. Now we're going to meet the forms of the genitive and add those to our table. Then we're gonna meet some practice sentences with the genitive and discuss a few more points of detail. And then we'll do the same with the dative. So I've added the genitive line now to our noun table. In the first declension, you'll see I've put the word timer, honor, but also the alpha, what we call the alpha variant. Here, the word chora, which is country. And that, as you will have, might, might, might have seen in a, in a previous video, uses an alpha in the singular forms, not an eater. And that happens because there's a row in the stem of this word, chora. In the second declension, we have masculine forms like logos, and we have a neuter form. Day wrong. Now I've highlighted here the genitive forms in both singular and plural. 
you may note a few things about the genitive forms. So firstly, in the neuter, the form of the genitive is the same as the masculine. And in fact, that's going to be the same for the dative as well. The neuter is only different from the masculine in the nominative and accusative lines, the top two lines of its table. Thereafter, it reverts to the, geni uh, to the masculine forms. Um, luckily, the genitive plural ending is the same for all the genders and in all the declensions. So we've got tone, timon, tone, corone, and that omega nu is a really useful clue that you're dealing with a genitive plural. And we're going to see that repeated throughout adjectives and other nouns too. And then finally, just be aware of that alpha variation within the first declension feminine. So tears, timers would be your standard pattern, but with the word hora, it's going to retain the alpha. So tears, horas. Now I've put in there also the form of the definite article because you can see that often there is a convenient rhyme between the form of the article and the ending of the noun. So those are your genitive forms. Now, when we meet and use the genitive in Greek, we also encounter a peculiar word order, and we call this the sandwich construction. A reminder, it's the owner that goes into the genitive and not the thing owned, and that's a very important thing to bear in mind. So what is this distinctive word order? Well, in English, a simple phrase like the words of the god or the god's words becomes in Greek this, hoi to theu logoi. As you can probably see there, something funny is going on with the word order. And in fact, the thing the, the genitive owns, the object owned, is on the outside of the sandwich, the bread, if you like, of our sandwich, hoi logoi, of the words. And here they are in red. The owner, the possessor, goes into the middle of the sandwich and thus becomes like the filling of the sandwich of the god. So really, this whole phrase means the of the god words. And that's a strange quirk of the Greek grammar. So the owner in the genitive goes into the middle of this sandwich construction. It does mean that you see two uh, lots of the article appearing um, in a row. So the article appears twice in a row, but there'll be different cases usually, and they're going with different nouns. So hoi and then two, nominative and then genitive. Hoi is going with logoi and two is going with theu. So with that quirk borne in mind, have a go at looking at these four sentences, all using the genitive. Pause the video, see if you can translate them, and then we'll go through them in just a tick. So here in red are the genitive words in each of these four sentences. And I've underlined, or highlighted them rather, and given you the translation underneath. So number one, treko pros ten oikian, and then it's that oikian to strategu. I run towards or to the house of the general. And note the general is there in the middle of the sandwich, turn to strategu oikian. In number two, aku omen tas fornas. We hear the voices and our genitive is tone angelon. We hear the voices of the messengers, tas ton angelon fornas. Again, our genitive sandwich. Number three, her corre ton to didaskalu hippon fulase. So her corre, the girl, fulase is guards, or she is guarding, ton hippon, the horse. Which horse or whose horse? Well, to didaskalu, the girl guards the horse of the teacher. Ton hippon, to didaskalu, ton to didaskalu, hippon in our genitive sandwich. And finally, hoi tes theas logoi, Fobon ferusin. The words hoi logoi, whose words? Of the goddess. The words of the goddess, tes theas, bring ferusin fear. Fobon. Maybe produce fear would be quite a nice rendering of that. The words of the goddess bring fear. 
Okay, so hopefully you spotted the genitive in each of those situations and you saw the sandwich construction working each time. Moving on to the dative. And here now is our table of the noun forms with that fourth line added in, the dative. And pretty much now these noun forms are complete. As we said, there are vocatives, but they're often the same as the nominative. And we don't really list them in a full table, uh, generally in most grammar books. So having a look at the dative forms, you'll see there's something weird going on in the spelling of the dative singular. And I've highlighted the endings here in red. Now in the dative singular, in each of these examples, you see there's a little squiggle underneath the vowel, whether it's an eta or an alpha or an omega. That squiggle is not a typo or a smudge. That squiggle is something called the iota subscript. And that is an iota that has been squished underneath the vowel. And it's sort of factored in when you're pronouncing it out loud, but don't worry too much about that for now. Some people don't sound that iota subscript at all when they're speaking Greek. So the iota subscript is a really good clue that you're dealing with a dative. Now in the plural, you'll note there's a similarity, I think, in sound between tais timais and tois logois. So here, the is, iota, sigma at the end of the dative plural forms is a useful sort of echo for you to bear in mind and, and look out for. Note again that in the singular of the first declension, there is this alpha variant. And here, te cora was, would have an alpha in the, the dative singular form. In the plural, of course, the word timer already uses an alpha, hi timai, etc. And so the alpha variant looks exactly the same as the normal forms for the uh, word timer. And a reminder too that the genitive and the dative of the of the neuter, so the word gift, for example, here, doron, are the same as the masculine. So that is a convenient uh, overlap and there's no new learning to do there. A few words about the main uses of the dative. As we said earlier, it's reserved for the indirect object, a noun that is involved in the sentence and best translated in English with the word to or for. So for example, if you're giving something to somebody, now the verb for I give in Greek, didomi, is a bit more complicated than our usual uh, present tense verbs we've met so far, but it's useful here just to illustrate the, the use of the dative. So didomi, I give, ten biblon, uh, the book, te kore, and there is your dative, to the girl. Now you might have spotted that kore is actually breaking the rule that you learnt about the variant in the first declension. It has an R in the stem, cor, but actually it doesn't use an alpha, where, when you'd expect actually it to use an alpha. Instead, it uses the eta, like uh, the word timer. So that's a little irregularity. In this sentence too, we've got the word ten biblon, the book. And you'll remember that biblon looks like it's going to be a masculine uh, noun, but actually it's feminine. It's uh, technically in the second declension, but it is uh, feminine. So it needs to have the feminine use of the article there, term biblon. Anyway, the key thing here is the dative, I give the book to the girl, ter corre. The dative can also be used after some prepositions. For example, the word in in Greek, which is en. And here a little sentence, ou trekomen en ter oikia. We do not run in the house. Um, ter oikia there is our dative after the word en. So the dative is used for uh, residual motion, as in when you're staying put in a place. And finally, the dative is used after certain verbs, which we, we say in Greek, take the dative, i.e. their object is not actually an accusative, but goes straight into the, the dative case instead. For example, there is a verb pistuo, which means I trust or believe. And when you say you trust something or somebody, you don't put that in the accusative, you use the dative. Maybe think of it like you're giving your trust to somebody and therefore there's an implied accusative there which is like your trust. So here, tois logois pistue, he or she believes or trusts the words tois logois go into the dative. Okay, that's the key uses of the dative. Have a look at the sentences 
and see if you can spot the dative and translate them. And in a, in a moment, we'll highlight the datives in red and just go through the translations. So I've put in red the datives. You might also have spotted a couple of genitives added in here too, and they're in purple in number one and in number five. And number three we'll talk about in just a, just a tick. So number one has this weird verb didomi, which means I give. And it means I give ta to angelu kremata, the of the messenger money. So that's a genitive sandwich. Tois nautais, to the sailors. The sailors there are, are dative. I give the money of the messenger to the sailors. Number two, hoi hippoi trekusin en to agro. The horses run or are running in the field. Agros is a field. Now there, the word en is your preposition and that takes a dative. The horses are running in the field. But note the difference between number two and number three. Number three, the only word which is different in terms of the vocab is the word ace rather than n. Now ace means into and ace doesn't go with the dative but it goes with an accusative. So here number three, hoi hippoi trekusin ace ton agron, the horses run into the field. Not just in the field this time which was the dative but into which is the accusative. And motion towards does use the accusative, whereas if you're staying put in a place, that uses the dative. Number four, hopolites to criter u pistue. The citizen does not trust the judge to criter. Critters is another one of these words which looks like it's feminine but actually is masculine. Um, that's the same as in number one actually with the word sailor. So uh, critter, hence it has an eater at the end which might mistake you uh, or trick you into thinking that it's feminine but actually to uh, it needs to be a masculine article because the word critter is, is a masculine. Anyway they're dative forms. The citizen does not trust the judge. And finally number five pistuo ter tes deas fone. I trust or believe Terfone, the voice, tes theas, of the goddess. And there's a nice genitive there to practice what we were doing earlier. Now I hope those examples of sentences are useful. By now you've met uh, all the four cases and you've seen them used in sentences, which means that you can now construct more, set, more complex sentences in Greek and translate them. Here's a recap slide which summarises the endings you've met so far. For the masculine, the feminine and the neuter. And I've put them in that order because you're going to see this pattern of endings recurring in different forms of Greek grammar, most prominently in adjectives. And there's a video about adjectives coming up shortly in the next couple of days. Now we normally list the, uh, the, the genders in the, in the order masculine, feminine and neuter and that is a reflection I'm afraid of a sort of inherent sexism within grammar over the centuries. Um, so masculine is listed before, before feminine. Now you'll note that also there is a really convenient rhyme between most of these forms for the nouns and the forms of the definite article, which is going to be on the next slide appearing now. And again, we've got the order masculine, feminine and neuter and the whole of the article listed there. So well done for making it this far through. You've now met all the four cases, nominative, accusative, genitive and dative, and spotted the distinctive things about each one. And for more resources about Greek grammar, do check out the website www.greeksummerschool.org. Thank you for listening and best of luck with your Greek.